Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm really glad to be here. Thank you to the organizer for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to share what we do with other colleagues in the near areas of research. So today, what we are going to talk about, me and uh, my colleague Gianluca, who's coming next, is about memory research. I'm more going to dive into what is what are the main technologies, or at least to give you some hint of what are the main technologies, because it will take more than three hours just to introduce them accurately. And then Gianluca will talk more about the architectures and how they are used. But first, let's take a look. At, uh, let's take a look back at the history of what has been memory source. So when everything started in our field, it was 1971. And there was this guy that now is in his 80s, Professor Leon Shua, that by writing down on a sheet of paper this simple diagram linking a voltage, fl magnetic flux, charge, and current, he noticed that something was missing. This thing that was asymmetrical, that made that diagram asymmetrical, he decided to call it memory store. Memory store is the um, contraction of memory resistor. It's a resistor that shows a memory property. And now we are going to explain exactly why. So the original formulation, which is reported on this slide, shows the, the first um, how Chua in 71 with, with his original paper introduced the memory store. And that that introduction, that formalization was an algebraic connection, an algebraic relation, closed or open, analytical or non-analytical, between the history of the voltage and the history of the current at the port. So you have this bipole, which is a thought to be a fourth fundamental element, and its conduction properties are determined by how much voltage has been applied in time or how much current has flown through its terminal. You can see it more specifically in the second form, which came out in uh, 1973, I think. And this is uh, uh, obtained in the voltage current domain, which is the derivative, which is uh, can uh, be easily der uh, derived by doing the derivation time with respect to time. Here, you can see that the conduction properties which are determined by the R, so the resistance of the bipole, is determined by the amount of charge that has flown through its terminals. Take care that in the flux charge domain, the relation is algebraic. So you have something that associates to one value of the charge, one value of the flux. While in the current voltage domain, what we experimentally measure at the time of speaking, we are seeing something like loops. When you excite a memory store or something that can be considered a memory store with a periodical waveform, then you are going to see a frequency dependent closed loop, a pinched loop, how it was called by Professor Chua. In fact, Professor Chua, now here I'm giving you some hint for whoever wants to dive more into the topic of uh, memory store taxonomy, there is this really good paper by Professor Fernando Corinto here at Politecnico. And here is also the book he has published the, the, um, a couple of months ago about nonlinear circuits and system with memory history. It introduced how the flux and charge can be still relevant for analyzing memory store based circuits. But this happened like in 1971, many years have passed and the interest was like really faded away quickly in the early days. But it was not a big problem because there was CMOS really developing faster and faster. More low was in its golden age. And so there was no need for alternative um, technologies for uh, computing. And also analog computing was put apart. But then 
in the last 20 years, in the last 20 years, 15, someone would argue 10, big data, internet, and so on and so forth, made available a really great bunch of data. This data was of fundamental importance for the development of uh, um, artificial neural networks, how they're conceived today, that they basically do magic. And the memory store interest was strongly revived by this um, resurgence of inter in, uh, artificial intelligence. So in 2008, a paper was published by HP Labs in California, the missing memory store found it's by somebody is considered a controversial uh, controversial claim because those technology existed previously but what the authors led by stanley williams wanted to point out was that that theoretical um behavior that was theorized 37 years before was finally uh, reconciled with what was the experimental measurements so let's see some memoristic exper experimentally acquired uh, memoristic characteristics. Those are um, measurements taken for triangular waves on um, PCM cell uh, phase change memory. And we can immediately notice that there are two kinds of phenomena. One is the volatile memory which means that you have sort of resistive switching which means that the um, resistance of this of the device goes from really low to high but then this effect fades away this means that a sort of leak integrator exists inside the device which uh, makes it lose its memory state and then on the other hand we have non-volatile uh, memory which can be observed concurrently inside the same devices for example on the lower plot you can see what is uh, a programming cycle composed of many um, triangular waves. And you can see that, for example, the threshold switching voltage is moving closer to the origin. So you have a reduction in the threshold switching. You also have, as I will show in a little bit, you also can measure if you have a really accurate instruments for doing uh, low current measurements of resistance, you can measure a really great homic behavior at really low field. And this is where um, the memory is stored. So of course it can be stored, uh, it can be used as, as a storage device. But let's say that in the last years, in the last uh, 10 years, maybe 3D integration of, uh, flash, uh, of NAND flash made the idea of substituting our current technology process for mass production of, um, of uh, memories unfeasible, I will say. But as I said before, there is a great interest in neural networks. We want something that can go beyond what are the limitation. And Gianluca will talk about that uh, in a few minutes. We, we need something that can make our computation boost, can uh, um, go beyond what is the von Neumann limitation. So there is a lot of interest about spiking neural networks, the reservoir computing, or oscillatory neural networks, which the memory store serves as a perfect candidate because it can strongly implement a neural synapses as in the brain. It also shows many phenomena like volatile memory and non-volatile memory coexisting, which is really typical of the uh, synapses in uh, mammalian brains. Now, let's go more into something more realistic. There are three technologies uh, which are predominant, predominant at the moment, resistive RAMs, phase change memory, and spin transfer torque. And there are also many others that I had not enough space or time to cite, but there are also many others under development. Some of them are even in, uh, on the market right now, and I'll show you one in a little bit. So let's start from one of the two, which I will talk about briefly. This is the RERAM, the filamentary conduction RERAM. So what you basically have is uh, an insulating layer between two metal electrodes, and then you have that some sort of ionic species can migrate from one electrode to the other. When the migration of those ionic species reaches the other, uh, the other uh, electrode, 
a channel is formed. So you go from, as you can see in step one, you go from high resistance states to low resistance states. And then when you come back, you remain in the low resistance state until you reach the point where you apply the opposite voltage, the opposite field. So you are moving back all those ionic pieces to the other side. And these can happen in many locations concurrently in the um, device. So by applying many set or reset pulses, you can tune what is the conductance or the resistance of this device. On the other hand, here we have the PCM, the phase change memory. They all basically work in the same manner. There are great developments in the latest years. But what the, the basic working principle is you have a crystalline phase, so some conducting material, and then you have some uh, insulating material in the same, I mean, the same chemical species can take both forms. You can think of it as glass, for example. This is a mushroom PCM cell based on GST, which in this amorphous phase, it's a glass, basically. So when you are in completely amorphous phase, you have a high resistance state because in amorphous materials, there's little conduction of electrons. But then when you shrink the mushroom, the conduction properties increase because the path that electrons have to take gets smaller and smaller. So by modulating this ratio between the two phases, you can store multi-level uh, of information on these devices, which are really compact. It can be scaled down, the, um, down to tens of nanometers. This is my main um, work area. So I spent my first and half year of my PhD working on this kind of device and on their compact modeling. And luckily, I cannot share with you the process because uh, uh, it's still unpublished to work. So I have to keep it secret, they told me. And I forget to tell you that this is also um, commercial technology. The 3D cross point that um, Intel ships with its obtain uh, memory boards, it's been confirmed to be a PCM, to be a phase change memory, probably used in its binary form, so zero and ones, but still, this does not preclude the possibility to use it as a multi-level storage device. Uh, the best is yet to come. Yeah, there is a lot of research, which I have no time to dive into, but there is um, many groups working on zero dimensional, one dimensional and two dimensional materials. Here at Polytechnic, we have Carlo Ricciardi, Professor Carlo Ricciardi working on nanowires that implement uh, memoristic behavior. And all those materials are really promising and show something closer to what is the actual synaptic behavior in the mammalian brain. So they're very promising, but maybe in the earlier days. So keep a look here. I've included also um, a really recent review about those materials, and you can read. And going to the core of this pitch. I'm just reporting you here what is the second order um, conduction model for the PCM mushroom. I will not explain it all in detail, but you can clearly see that you first need to compute uh, the um, field profile, the phi. Then you have to find its maximum. Then you have to integrate that maximum multiplied by the sign. Then you have to take into account all those terms. It's a real mess, I would say. Then I just forgot to mention you that there are also three nonlinear differential equations associated to this uh, little beast. But basically, this is the trade-off that we are making in neuromorphic computing. We are trading uh, like small sizes, so reduce the circuit complexity for really complex devices, which are really hard to model and that show many concurrent phenomena happening at the same time. But this, I mean, this is still a memoristor, right? 
those are, this is the um, hallmark, as uh, Professor Shua always says, this is a hallmark of memoristic behavior. When you um, put a um, bipolar wave, a periodic wave on your device, and what you see, what you get from your device is a pinched loop response. This means that you are seeing um, memory stir. And just to be clear, to complete my uh, introduction, here you can see what are where is the actual memory storage. You can notice those are many homic low current uh, IV curves taken for a PCM cell. All those PCM cells were set to different uh, state variable value, which is UA by the way. It's the thickness of the amorphous dome, and. On all those levels, you can store information. You can encode different uh, codes. Now, are complex equations daily useful to us as engineers? Well, I think that this is not the best. They are not the best for our mental health. Uh, let you think solving every time the diode equation with a series of resistor by hand. It's like crazy. So there are many tools invented for simplifying our lives, like body plots, like uh, IV characteristic for uh, MOSFETs, where you just have to consider where the um, load, load uh, line uh, lies on the IV plane, and you have found which is the base point. You have the Nyquist diagrams for analyzing the stability of circuits. So there are all these uh, graphical tools which or they all assume some kind of simplification, some kind of um, compactness of the model. But they are daily useful for engineers who want to uh, design an actual system that works. So do you expect these memoristor, I mean, you cannot answer, but do you expect these memoristor to have a really complex differential algebraic equation? Well, this is, uh, for clarity, this is the first memory store that was experimentally proven, let's say. It's the 2008 memory store. Works by moving uh, uh, oxygen, oxygen vacancies inside um, insulating material. No, this was compactly modeled. It's really simple. It's clear and it's elegant. You also have many physics-based models, which are of indubious uh, uh, utility. When you want to go to really fine detail, you need a really accurate model. But for doing like some quality um, computation to, to just understand how the device works, here it's really easy, it's elegant. You can see there is a differential equation which dictates the movement of the state variable W, which is the border between the doped and the undoped region basically where there's a high concentration of oxygen and where there is a low concentration of oxygen. And then you see that the Holmes law is so simple that it can be integrated. This device can be represented in the flux charge domain and it shows, um, it, it can uh, be used to compute uh, the response of those devices in certain region of their operating uh, area. Now let's go back to the PCM, which is my main uh, focus on the side of um, uh, device modeling. So I cannot show you the actual model because it's still under review. We have to have it published. But what I can tell you is that the basic final step of that model, like for the um, memory uh, for the transistor was the um, uh, to put in place what are the IV curves in order to have engineers designed uh, circuits based on transistors. Here, as was uh, suggested by Professor Shua, we have dynamic dynamic root maps, and this is the last slide I'm showing you because I think I'm also out of time. So if you will excuse me. This is the dynamic root map for up. PCM uh, mushroom cell. This was also confirmed experimentally. So we have also the experimental part available in the uh, upcoming paper. 
And but you will ask, what does this serve to? What's its utility? Well, I'll explain it in two minutes. Here you have the uh, rate of change of the state variable on the y-axis and the state variable itself on the x-axis. So you parameterize those curves on the input level. So you have like 1.61, 1.69, 1.92, two volts, and so on and so forth. And you get what will be the um, the, the evolution of the state variable if you apply that input for an indefinitely long amount of time. This thing gives some really interesting hint inside the working or uh, the working the working of the device. I mean, at this point, for example, PCMs are um, a program by a series of um, square pulses. So you apply, like, you know, that for after reset for reaching uh, 12 kilo ohms, you need uh, 100 pulses. So, OK, you apply 100 pulses at 1 volt, 2 volts, and the resistance goes down. But are really square pulses useful for our purpose? I mean, if we had like an ideal sharp pulse, which goes up to a maximum value and down without any rising edge or falling edge, or just something straight. Will that pulse be effective? Well, in this plot, I showed that, no, they're not the best, uh, the best uh, waveforms. Because as you can see, for a fixed, um, for the fixed voltage, for a fixed voltage level, so when you reach the plateau of your um, square pulse, then you will have that if you apply that pulse for too long and you're already in a certain region of the state variable, so in a certain resistive state, that pulse is ineffective because uh, as you can see, for example, following the 1.61, the Sayano curve, after you reach that uh, resistance state, which is associated to about four nanometers, more or less, then you are not going to move any nanometer anymore because this is ineffective. What physically happens is that you have reached a distance between the heater, the bottom electrode of the mushroom, and the border between the crystalline and the amorphous phase, which makes the temperature at the interface too high to have more crystallization, to reduce, um, to reduce uh, further the resistance. So what can we get qualitatively from, from this plot, which is the real important point? That maybe square pulses are not the best. Maybe what we should use is something that has a varying profile, like a triangular wave. Triangular wave will be, for example, the best because it allows to explore an entire region. And if those waves are even controlled with a previous reading of the state variable, then they can be mod modeled in order to reach the final programming value in a fraction of the time of, prog of programming that was initially required. And hopefully somebody will find <laughs> this research useful someday. I repeat, I am really sorry for not showing you the actual model, but they told me don't do it. And really, thank you for your attention. OK, thank you, Francesco. I see we, are heading, we already have two questions from our IEEE members. The first one is, to your knowledge, do current simulators implement any memoristic models we can play around with? Yes, there are some memory store models. You can check the work done by Professor Enrique Miranda at uh, Barcelona Polytechnic University or Madrid, I don't remember, sorry, Miranda. And he and many others, you can also check the work done by Alan Ascoli at uh, TU Dresden. He also done some really heavy modeling in that uh, regard, like spice models and all those kind of stuff. I mean, this is eventually what we are heading to, to have like a really good space models for a PCM cell, which at the time is <coughs> there. Are, the industry like IBM who develops this kind of technology as its internal model, but it's hard for them to make them public. 
Okay, thank you. The second question is, uh, do you think process variations and technological uncertainties may impact on the final device performance? And if yes, can you consider these variations in the model? Well, for considering the variations in the model, ask my colleague, <laughs> Luca, he's a statistician, okay. <laughs> he, he knows better than me, but I, I can speak about the electronic part and what is the technology part. For sure, those have been a uh, um, limiting factor for the development of this kind of technology. But you know that in uh, artificial neural networks, uh, in uh, all those kind of algorithms, you do not actually need that much precision of the single device. You can compensate it globally. And then there is also another interesting effect, which maybe Gianluca will talk about, that if you have many of those devices, being their, um, their characteristic, uh, all stochastic, more or less in the same manner. So we can consider that they are Gaussianly distributed. When you try to attempt to program them, you have a variation, but it's a stochastic, it's Gaussian. When you have like 1 million of those uh, devices that are all stochastic, eventually they will compensate each other. You have like 200,000 that are a little bit higher in conductance and 200,000 that are a little bit lower in conductance. So the final result is, is higher in precision in accuracy than what are the accuracies of your stacking devices.